Good morning, church. The Lord is in this place. Amen. Oh, what a joy to be together worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful uh, to Pastor Greg, to the leadership here for uh, this opportunity once again to come and preach God's word to you. I've been so looking forward to it. Uh, let me begin by just saying this. I can honestly say that I have experienced culture shock maybe just twice in my lifetime. Uh, the first time was when we moved as a family from India to New York City. Uh, that was some culture shock, especially winter in New York. But the second culture shock was from New York to Texas. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we lived in New York for about 22 years and we just moved to Houston uh, last year, actually last year in August, so it's not been a year, uh, but what a transition it has been. I remember the first time we walked into HEB <laughs> and my six-year-old son at that point, when we stepped in, he looked up this way and he said, wow, this is like heaven. By the time we got our bill, it didn't feel like heaven. <laughs> but um, the first time I got into Bucky's, oh my goodness, I was just going in for the gas, that's all. I didn't know there was a shopping mall attached to a gas station. And so by the time I came out, I had Bucky's t-shirt for the whole family. I had a Bucky's apron of all things. I had honey roasted pecan on one hand and brisket sandwich on the other hand. And I did use their bathroom, so I go back all the time. It's such a great place, such a... Now, I won't talk about how you all drive down here, but um, I will talk about how warm and welcoming Houston has been, not just to us, listen, I think the nations are coming here to Houston. It's, it's becoming one of the most diverse uh, cities in America, maybe even, even in the world. It's becoming so diverse because there is a culture of hospitality that is here in this city. Um, I've been reading Erica Greider's book. It's a long title. Uh, her book is called Big, Hot, Cheap, and Right what Americans can learn from the strange genius of Texas. Quite a book, humorous also. And she calls Texas super Americans, Americans on steroids. And then she says, it's the people of Texas that makes them different. My perspective is just having moved here, what I've seen is that there is an underbelly, an underlying of a Judeo-Christian value that people are so hospitable and kind for the most part. And even as the nations have come here, uh, our, our family, after 13 years of being in New York City, uh, by God's grace, we planted a church there. Our church is still going strong, but we really sense that our time in New York was fulfilled, not finished, and we moved here to Houston so that we can be an ambassador for Christ to the nations uh, that have come here. And Houston's first. As a family, we want to thank you. We are so grateful for your partnership over the years in New York City. And even here, our family, I think I have a picture of our family. We live in a missionary housing, a stone throw away from here. And we're so grateful for you, especially to the missions office and to the missionary care team. Thank you so much for your support, your care, and your prayers. As we turn to God's word, the other reason I show you the picture of our family is because just last week, Lisha and I, we celebrated 15 years of marriage. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. 15 years of marriage. I'm grateful for that. And you know, uh, the, the night before, our three-year-old was sick. And so she was, our three-year-old was wedged between me and Lisha. But when we woke up in the morning, Lisha and I not only wished one another in a happy anniversary, but we spontaneously 
began to renew our vows. And uh, I began by saying, to have and to hold, for richer, for poorer, for better or worse, in sickness or in health, and, I, and we made it more personal by saying in New York or in Texas, <laughs> in missionary housing or mother-in-law's house, mountain tops or valleys low, till death do us part. I am yours and you are mine. And, and you know, we had a great day of celebration on our, on our anniversary, but that moment of renewing our vows was the most sacred and in, intimate moment uh, that we had. Church, a vow is like a strong anchor to a swaying boat on an ocean. A vow is like a sturdy pot to hold a seed so that it can grow bud and flower. A vow is like a firm foundation, even as we sang, Christ is my firm foundation. A vow is like a firm foundation of a building, hidden but most essential. It was the German pastor and activist Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he, he once counseled a young couple and he told them these, these powerful words. He told them, today you are young and very much in love and you think that your love can sustain your marriage vows. It cannot. Let your marriage vows sustain your love. Let your marriage vows sustain your love. The point I want to bring to you before you this morning is this. Just as a marriage vow between a husband and a wife is renewed so that they can recommit themselves to the mission set before them. Marriage is a mission. I am persuaded that we as the bride of Christ ought to renew our vows to Christ so as to fulfill our God-given mission, beginning right here in Houston. When you read God's word, the decisive charge against God's people, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, was just not that of breaking the commandments or an act of rebellion. The decisive charge against God's people was that of adultery. In the Old Testament, when God's people came out of slavery, came out of Egypt into the promised land, you know what God would tell to Moses in Deuteronomy 31 verse 16? God would tell to Moses, and these are sobering words. He would say, the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant, the vow, the promise I made with them. In the New Testament, James, the half-brother of Jesus, He's writing a circular letter to the churches. And this is what James write in chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. James would begin by saying, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says... He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. When you love someone deeply and they go away to someone else, there is holy jealousy. It's appropriate to be jealous because you love that person. And scripture is telling us that God loves us so much that when we Walk away from him. He is jealous for us. Listen to me, church, this morning. What God desires from his church is spousal intimacy, not just a religious affair. It's a spousal intimacy, not just 
a religious affair. Like a bride and a bridegroom that makes vows and embark on a mission, we are called to so fall in love with Jesus, follow him closely, and then be on mission together with God. Paul would be so bold to write that we are co-laborers, co-partners with God. Now, marriage takes two parties. Intimacy takes two parties. From God's side, his love for us is not in question. There is no doubt about God's love for us. In fact, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 and 19 puts it this way. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love because he first loved us. There is no question about God's love for us. My question for us this morning, my challenge for us this morning is, what about our love for God? Do they match? I'm sure there are many here this morning who have gone through difficult episodes in your life, in your relationships. Broken relationships happen when the parties are not on the same page. Their love is no longer matching. Intimacy grows cold. And this morning I want to ask you, how is your love for Christ? Because his love for you is fierce, is furious. He loves you. And so this morning, I want to call us to renew our vows to Jesus. And I want us to do that by looking at the first call of Jesus to his disciples. Uh, it is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. It should be on the screen. It's found in Matthew 4, 19. It's found in Luke 5, 10. The first call of Jesus, all of the gospel writers, they put it this way. Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. It's up on the screen. Can I invite you? Can we read this together? Come on, let's read this together. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The first call of Jesus to us. And I want to look at this verse in three parts. Come, follow me. That's relational. And I will make you become. That's transformational. Fishers of men. That's missional. Relational, transformational, and missional. So let's look, clo let's look closely at these wooing words of Jesus. Come, follow me. Christianity ultimately is not about following some dogma or creed or doctrine as important as they are. It first is about following a person. And that's why we rightly say Christianity is not just a religion, it's a relationship. But relationships don't just happen. There is a coming after that happens in a relationship. You know, I grew up in, in India the first 20 years of my life. A land of so many religions and cults and belief systems. And one thing that I've seen in India is this. In every religion or even cult, it's the disciples or the followers who have to go and run after the teacher or the guru or the prophet. In fact, there are terms in the Hindu worldview. It's the word guru and shishya. Shishya is a student. Guru is the teacher. In an Islamic worldview, the terms are Ustad and Shagird. It is the Shishya or the Shagird 
who always runs after the guru or the ustad, never the other way. But what you see here in the gospel is this. It is not the disciples who came looking for Jesus. It is Jesus who came looking for them. And that is good news. Amen. It is Jesus who comes looking for them. It is Jesus who comes looking for you. In John 15 verse 16, Jesus would say these words. He would say, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Jesus literally would come walking in a fish market and would look at these ordinary, uneducated fishermen and call them to himself. In every other religion, the founder, the guru, the ustad, or the prophet says, I am here to point you to a way to know God, is what they say. But Jesus comes and Jesus says, I am God and I have come to find you. There's a difference of day and night. Jesus comes to us and Jesus is the one saying, come follow me. In the gospel of John, if you have your Bibles in chapter one, look at verse 35 through 42. The word of God says, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the lamb of God, the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. Come and you will see. The word therefore staying, where are you staying in verse 38 of John 1 is the word in Greek, uh, meno. And meno means to abide, to remain, to be at home. The disciples were asking Jesus, where are you staying? Where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? And Jesus would respond by saying, come and see. If you are in a rush, if you are busy, you can't see. Seeing assumes slowing down, abiding, remaining. In fact, Jesus will go on and tell his disciples in the final hours of his life before he would be arrested, betrayed, crucified. In John 15, he would use the word meno, 10 times, John 15. Let me read the, ver the first five verses of John 15. This is what Jesus says to his disciples and to us. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And nothing in the Greek means nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As you read John 15 and Jesus repeating 10 times to abide in him, to remain in him, to make home with him, church, Jesus is saying at least two things. First of all, 
You can't love somebody that you don't know. You can't love somebody that you don't know. And to love somebody, it requires abiding, being with them, communicating with them, doing life with them. Jesus is calling us to abide with him. But secondly, what Jesus is also telling his disciples is this. You cannot do anything of eternal significance without abiding in me. This is the call of Jesus to us. And that's why Jesus has some very strong words to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 3. Remember, in Revelation 3, Jesus would tell them, I know your deeds, your labor. I know your perseverance. I know that you have endured many things for the sake of my name. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. I hope and pray that this is not what is said about our church. That this is not what is said about Houston's verse. That you are doing amazing things. You are giving. You are going. But you have abandoned your first love. Rebecca McLaughlin puts it this way. She says, she writes, If Jesus is the bread of life, loss of Jesus means starving. Starving. If Jesus is the light of the world, loss of Jesus means darkness. If Jesus is the good shepherd, loss of Jesus means wandering alone and lost. If Jesus is the resurrection and the life, loss of Jesus is eternal death. And if Jesus is the Lamb of God, sacrifice for our sins, loss of Jesus means paying that price ourselves. Come. Follow me, and I will make you become into that man and woman that I purpose you to be. The claim of Christianity is nothing short than new birth, new life. Jesus would tell to a religious leader, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that is what he, Jesus came to give us. He says, come follow me and I will make you become into who you were made to be. You see that transformation. You see that transformation in the lives of ordinary men and women, uneducated, unknown, and yet even their critics said, these people have been with Jesus. Is that what they say about us? They are Jesus people. So how can we be transformed? What is the call of Jesus? How can we truly change? Isn't that the question that the culture is asking? Those are the types of books that fill, fills the Barnes and Nobles, self-help books. Some are helpful, not many. How can we be transformed? I want you to look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 3.18 because it, it, it gives us in a nutshell how can we be transformed. The word of God says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Pay close, close attention there. It says, when we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I want you to listen to me. What we behold, we become. <clears throat> what we behold, we become. 
What we give our attention to will determine our thoughts, our beliefs, our behavior. Let me confess something to you as I'm standing up here. Probably one of the biggest reasons I struggle, even though I'm a missionary, that I struggle in consistently abiding with Jesus is because I am constantly distracted and abiding in other things, especially this thing right here. <clears throat> Studies have shown that an average American spends about four to five hours scrolling on the phone each day. And most of it, if we are honest, social media, news, other people's opinions, four to five hours. Studies have shown that an average American watches TV about two hours. And if it is sports season, it's even more. That we are bombarded and exposed to 2,000 to 3,000 advertisements every day. They, sh they shape us, they form us. No wonder mental health experts have, have called a new disease called hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. In John Mark Comer's excellent book, Practicing the Way, he writes this. <clears throat> Please listen. He says, if we are rooted in the infinite scroll of social media, it will form us. Likely into people who are angry, anxious, arrogant, simplistic, and distracted. If we are rooted in the endless cues of our streaming platforms of choices, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Prime, you name it, they will form us too, likely into people who are lustful, restless, bored, never present. If we are rooted in the pursuit of hedonism, Pleasure, worldly pleasures, another drink, another toke, another hookup to take the edge off the pain and let us find a moment's peace that'll, that will form us as well. Likely into people who are compulsive, addictive, and running from our pain and simultaneously our healing. So where are we abiding? Where do you make your home at? Dallas Willard said, the cost of discipleship is high, but the cost of non-discipleship is higher. Jesus calls us to abide in him. He is the vine. We are called to be branches. We are grafted in and listen church, when we abide in Jesus, when we remain in him, the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to fill our lives. We become people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-discipline. Self-control. You know what that self-discipline means? It means people who return back to God. A self-disciplined Christian is someone who is abiding in Christ. What we behold, we become. No other guru no other founder has ever said, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and light because anything or anyone that you follow will give you a yoke. They come with a yoke. 
And that yoke is heavy and exhausting. Only Jesus can give us a yoke that is easy and light. Only Jesus can give us soul rest. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and that's why the first thing that Jesus says about prayer is this. He said, the first thing that Jesus said about prayer was not words, but a place. When you pray, he says, go into your room. Where do you meet with God? Maybe it's, it's an armchair. Maybe it's a particular room in your house. I love a, a sofa a place that I get on my knees and I get my honey ginseng green tea as I'm meeting with the Lord. Or sometimes I have a particular bench there at Memorial Park where I meet with Jesus. Where do you meet with him? Because as we meet with him, as we commune with him, listen, we will become fishers of men or we will become fishers of friends. We will become people of love. We will become people known by our kindness, our gentleness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Fishers of men is more than, a, you know, street evangelism. And I love street evangelism. That is what we did with the mission teams that came from Houston's first, we would go into the streets of New York, into the subways of New York, and, and there is a part to that of going out, sharing the gospel of Jesus. But I believe that what Jesus is saying here, come follow me, and I will make you, I will make you become fishers of men. What I believe he is really saying is, I will make you become friend of sinners as they call Jesus. I will make you become people that, that have strong convictions, but selflessly love others who are not like you, who don't believe like you, who look different and smell different and talk different, and yet you love them with the love of Christ. Fishers of friends. A few weeks ago, our family went on a camping trip. And it was a beautiful sight in upstate New York. I think I have a picture of us, you know, by the tents. My kids were having such a great time. And uh, on this particular day, there was a table and a brother and a sister had a lemonade stand. And they were uh, selling lemonades at this, this camping site. Well, my kids, because they love lemonade, they took their scooters, they went down, and uh, this brother and sister were very smart. They were giving out free samples. <laughs> now, you don't give free samples to kids. So once my kids tasted the free sample, they came to us and said, we need to buy the lemonade. And so we gave them a dollar, they went down, got the lemonade, and then they told the brother and sister, this is so good. We're gonna go all over this camping site and tell everyone about it. My kids went so far, there was a lady who said, I can't come there, but here is a dollar, take it. Thank you for coming all the way. By the time my kids came back to the table, there was a stream of people and so this brother and sister gave $2 to my kids and said, thank you, because of you, all these people have come. That day, my kids made $3, amen. <laughs> For a missionary who is raising support, that's a good sign. <laughs> when you love something, when you love something, you can't help but tell it to everyone. Whatever you prize, you proclaim. What have you been prizing lately? For Jabbar, who is from Nepal, from a non-Christian background, when he came to know the Lord Jesus, 
He surrendered his life to Jesus. And Jabbar said, from now on, I will follow Jesus. He is my guru. And he forsook all his idols. I remember, remember going to his house and taking all the idols out of his house. And I have a picture of the day of his baptism. Look at the joy in his face as he got baptized. But he didn't end there. The first person that Jabbar led to the Lord was his own son. And look at the baptism of his son. You see the joy in his face? In John chapter 1 that I read earlier, when Jesus would tell his disciples, come and see. Once Andrew experienced that, you know what happened? Keep reading in John 1 verse 40 and 42. It says this, one of the two who, who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Andrew became a person of love as he spent time with the Lord of love. This love makes us people with strong convictions, but we love people deeply. Doesn't matter what background they come from, we love them deeply. Because when you abide in Jesus church, when you remain with him, you begin to have his love for that person. You begin to have God's desires for that person, whoever that person is. But when you don't have his love, listen, your natural love will be quickly exhausted and you will become bitter and maybe even bored. Abide in him this morning. The vows as I close, the vows that my wife and I made, listen, those vows were made with words and with ink. The vows that Jesus makes with you was by shedding his own precious blood. The vows and the promises and the covenant that God makes with you is at the expense of his son. That by his death and resurrection, he has made us his people. He has made you sons and daughters. He has made us the bride of his son. It's a costly vow. And my challenge to you this morning is this. Does your love for Jesus, does it match the love of Jesus for you? If you, like me, find yourself to be in a place where your love is frail or weak or feeble, you are in the right place. Jesus says to us, come to me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you become. Even as we prepare to pray, I want to put up this verse from John 15. Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Can you just take a moment and just look at that verse? Look at those words of Jesus. Take it in. Respond to him. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Church, the reward of following Jesus is ultimately Jesus himself. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the prince of peace. He is our joy. And as we abide in him, we become People of love. We become people who are on mission. 
So even as you pray, remember a vow is like a strong anchor for a swaying boat. It's like a sturdy pot that holds the seed so that you and I can grow and bud and flower and bear much fruit. A vow is like a firm foundation of a building, hidden but most essential. God, I pray that we will become people like that, that we will become a Psalm 1 man and woman like a tree that is planted by streams of water whose leaves doesn't wither, that bears fruit, and in all that he or she does, they prosper. God, I pray that you would use us as a church to be a people in a church that loves our city, oh God, so that many will turn to you and many will become disciples, followers of Jesus, and they themselves will become fishers of men and women. God, we choose this morning to abide in you. We want to be a people who remain in you. Forgive us, O oh God, when we're always in, in a hurry. Forgive us, O oh God, when we're always rushing. Jesus, when you taught us to pray, you said, when you pray, go into your room. God, I pray that each one of us will find that place to meet with you, to commune with you, so that as we behold you, we will become more like you. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Hallelujah. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.